want to talk to you tonight about regret. My habitual state of regret makes things difficult for me. Sorry, I have to set your timer. And it makes me feel very guilty. In the 60s, when I was a girl, any qualms of culpability expressed during that fool's paradise were quickly ridiculed, particularly given the newly fashionable idea of destiny first encountered by many in Eastern religions. If I behaved badly or foolishly, I was breezily reassured that it was because of all that had happened before and would, to my alarm, serve for good or ill to influence all that would happen in the years ahead. It was a kind of hippie Calvinism. Who I was and how I manifested the self that I had been given was already determined. What possible good could regret do? Thanks also to karma, an idea which I refused to accept even then, my afterlife would also be arranged, rendering any indulgence in regret doubly wasteful. The belief that regret is a hopeless squandering of time and energy is a very self-serving philosophy. It absolves one of responsibility. When I first read V.S. Naipaul, I was surprised to discover that the Hindu idea of reincarnation was not unlike the ease and, and even lack of interest with which people of my generation um, viewed the world. I'm mistrustful of people who don't have regrets. And by regret, I am not referring to the French class that I wish I'd, I'd taken or the undervalued drawing I should have bought. <laughs> and I don't mean remorse. I mean the regret that we feel when we think even badly, the things that we have said or done that later cause us to flinch in embarrassment and, sh and shame, if not horror. The compromises that seemed at the moment to make life bearable, but in retrospect, were clearly, undeniably selfish, willful, and destructive. Regret is not to be confused with remorse. Remorse is far more weighty. I regret not attending the luncheon for my mother-in-law. I feel very remorseful for then setting the restaurant on fire. <laughs> As is perhaps the intention, regret often causes us more pain than that which we regret, which leads me to wonder if regret is not in itself the intention. Making rules for the future, determining penances and penalties can become wearisome to others as well, threatening to destabilize our already delicate sense of self. The very idea of regret is based on an assumption of privilege and the certainty of alternatives. Living as though everything that we suffer can be put to use someday is an idea that presupposes we will always have the luxury of choice. Um, when I was, uh, I grew up in Hawaii, as you know, and uh, I was the oldest of five children. And the child next to me in age was my brother Rick, who was three years younger. And as children, we were members of a private club called the Outrigger Canoe Club on the beach at Waikiki. And we would go there after school um, at Punahou in the afternoon. It's where we first learned to surf. It's where we kept our bathing suits. It's where we kept our surfboards. Um, and it was also a place where we would eat. We, we belonged, um, you know, in country clubs, you do, there's no cash. You sign chits. And there was a snack bar that had wonderful tuna fish sandwiches and lemon Cokes. And occasionally, we would even have a chocolate milkshake. But my mother died when we were children. I was 12. My father remarried the following year. And 
a particularly satanic woman <laughs> who's <laughs> I'm, I wasn't being funny she um, and her sole goal in life was to um, make us unhappy and and to find ways to rob us of uh, joy and one of the things she did was of course to cancel our membership at the Outrigger. Uh, my brother, however, continued to go and continued to ask friends to join him and to have lunch at the snack bar. But as he was no longer a member, he couldn't sign his own name. And he signed the name of his best friend, a boy called Kit Collins, who was from a family that lived both in California and in Hawaii. His great-grandfather had owned the racehorse, sea biscuit. So eventually, um, the family accountant of the Collins noticed these <laughs> chits and spoke to someone at the club, and my brother was caught. He was deeply, deeply ashamed and humiliated and confused by what he had done. Uh, and so made so awkward and so tortured by it that it ended his friendship with Kit, whom he loved, and he could no longer even look at him. So years and years and years went by, I, 50 years went by, and this would come up, this, this misadventure, every so often, um, at least once, maybe twice a year. And as we grew older, of course, it became clearer to us and uh, why it had happened and why he had done what he had done. And um, it, it seemed to become easier for him to think about it, but still 50 years. And I finally, one night, it would also always come up late at night, usually after a night of drinking or smoking pot. And he, he, I finally said to him, you know, I, I can't have this conversation anymore. I just can't. You have to resolve it or um, forgive yourself or you have to deal with it in some way. So he called Kit Collins. This is after 50 years. That's not an exaggeration. And um, told him why he was calling after so long and explained how he felt and how upset he was. And Kit Collins had no idea what he was talking about. Worse, Kit Collins was absolutely furious, outraged, and hung up on him. So my brother called to tell me about this. And um, I started to laugh. And I said, um, are you happy now? <laughs> and he said, Yes, I thought that I was going to have to give up my regret. But it turns out I really regret calling him. <laughs> and I regret even more all those years that I was regretting it. So I have more regret than ever, and it's wonderful. Yes, I'm happy now. <laughs> Thank you.